Hi, welcome back to Biology. My name is Mr. Kabuski. Uh, today we're going to finish up our talk about evolution. This is the sixth part of our discussion. I know that's a lot, uh, but there's just a lot of information and it's a lot of fun to talk about, um, you know, how things got here and the history of the planet and, you know, changes over time. It's just good stuff. So anyways, we're going to talk about speciation today, how to form a new species. Uh, and then after that, we're going to talk about something called cladistics, how we can show relatedness of species uh, and we can kind of illustrate that. Okay, uh, this shouldn't be a long talk. Uh, so hang with me, and we'll uh, learn something today. Okay, so what is considered a species? How are, and you know, what makes you a species? So here in this picture, I've got three different cats. I have a lion on the left, I have a tiger on the right, and in the middle, this is a liger. Uh, it's when there's a male lion and a female tiger. They happen to mate. Uh, they can create a liger. Now, ligers do not happen in nature. They only occur in zoos because that's the only time lions and tigers are put in close enough proximity to each other that they can form a bond and mate. Uh, the, this does not happen in nature because in nature, lions spend their time in the savannas, whereas tigers spend their time in the jungles, so they don't intermix anymore. But at one time, they used to be the same thing. I know that because, A, they share a lot of similar traits, and, B, they must share enough DNA still that they can produce an offspring. So how come when I mate different types of dogs, like a Labrador and a Poodle, I get a Labradoodle, and those are all considered the same species, but yet when I mate a lion and a tiger to get a liger, these are considered two different species? Well, the reason is because of something called the biological species concept. It's the idea that a group of organisms is considered a species if they're closely related, and they mate in nature naturally, and their offspring are fertile, meaning that their offspring can produce their own babies of similar type. Since lions and tigers produce ligers which are infertile, lions and tigers are their own species. This is the same with mules, like horses and donkeys combined, you make a mule. Uh, the mules are infertile, cannot have their own offspring, so therefore they're considered two different species. Okay, So that's the idea. So how are species maintained? How do we prevent uh, this this splitting up of these two, two groups, okay? Well, there's two ways, and they are known as gene flow and genetic drift, okay? Gene flow is the natural movement of alleles in a population. The amount of blue eyes in the human population, okay? Uh, the amount of dark fur in, uh, in a wolf population, things like that, okay? You're going to come up a certain amount of times just naturally without natural selection taking place, just in equilibrium, you know, we've got a nice little population, nothing exciting is happening to Genetic drift is when our population starts to move towards one uh, type of allele rather than the other. One might be more beneficial. Okay, so genetic drift is because of natural selection, like the ones that with the longer necks or the bigger wings or the, the shorter beak, whatever it happens to be, they're the ones that are selected for. So that's genetic drift, when you move towards one direction or the other. Okay? Gene flow and genetic drift, you see these occur a lot, like especially in like predators, things with like alpha males, like for example, okay, let's say in this bug population, uh, these bugs compete for mates. So these are two males, they're competing for these four females. Well, whichever one wins the competition, the battle, like you think about rams butting heads and deer fighting with their antlers, whichever one wins the competition, the other one gets kicked out. Well, they have to go find a new population to kind of mate with or, fire or spend time with. And so that's the idea of immigration and emigration, and that leads to gene flow. Well, at the same time, we're still kind of working with genetic drift here because we're moving towards an idea that the stronger males are the ones that are reproducing, and so their genes are going to be the ones that are passed on. So we're going to be moving towards more and more stronger males in our population. So you can see how gene flow and genetic drift help to maintain a species. So how is a new species formed? Take a look at this picture. Okay, we have our rog, our rabbit dog looking thing here. Okay, this is just a hypothetical, obviously. Uh, some type of barrier is established. It's separating two groups of these species, of this same species. Well, over time, these two species or two, these two populations are diverging from each other. Remember, we learned that term last time. They're splitting up and they, because they're only spending time reproducing in their own little pool here. Like I'm only reproducing at the bottom here with the ones with pointy ears and tails. At the top here I'm only reproducing with the ones with short tails and floppy ears. Like those are the only ones that are in my population, so the only ones that I can reproduce with. So over time, since those are the only ones that I'm reproducing with, certain mutations will occur, certain genes will show up or not show up, and so my DNA has changed a little bit to the point where I can no longer mate with that same population on the other side. 
So that's the number three here, where reproductive incompatibility is established. So once they are no longer able to reproduce, they have become their own species. Okay, so it's the process by which new species are formed, and it's usually caused because of some type of isolation, some barrier that is established between the two groups. For example, take a look at these bugs. So I've got brownish bugs, and I've got goldish bugs. Something happens, earthquake, something splits land masses, and all of a sudden there's a river that's formed between the two bugs. So these bugs aren't able to fly, they have to crawl. So now I'm kind of separated from my bugs on the right side of the river from the left side of the river. They're no longer able to mate with the opposite side. So over time, since I can only mate with my one side, over here there's a mutation that causes darker shells, and the darker shells are selected for, the lighter shells disappear. On the opposite side, it's the opposite rule. The darker shells are gone, only the lighter shells are the ones that survive. Well, these have become two different species. So let's say the river dries up. Well, now these two populations can now intermix again, but they can no longer breed. And so this is how you see, like, maybe you see two of the same species, or two different species of the same type of animal in the same environment. There was some type of barrier that formed. They were separated for a long enough period of time that they became their own species, and then they came back together. Okay, how does this happen? There's some different ways. It could be a geographic isolation, like, like I said, a mountain range, a river forms, like some type of barrier is literally put in between them, a physical barrier. It could be reproductive isolation, the time of year that you mate. This happens a lot with amphibians because they do their thing during certain wet seasons. Uh, so this is how we get different species of frog, because if I'm only mating in April, and I'm only mating with the frogs that also mate in April, the ones that mate in September only mate with the ones that also mate in September, and so therefore I've created two different populations. And so that's called reproductive isolation. Mechanical isolation, that's when you are no longer able to physically uh, reproduce. There's a funny little cartoon about that. Gametic, uh, that's when your gametes are no longer compatible. Uh, you may be able to physically like mate, but you can't reproduce because your sperm and your egg no longer are compatible with each other. And then behavioral isolation. There's a really interesting study on blue-footed boobies. Yes, that's what they're called. Uh, on the Galapagos Islands, there's two different populations of them. They look very similar. The difference between them is how they attract mates. On the one side, they do this weird little mating dance, and the females also do the matching dance. On the opposite side, you also have blue-footed boobies that do this like thing with their arms and their beaks, and they kind of point themselves in a certain way, and the way they point themselves is how they attract mates. So they are behaviorally isolating themselves from one another. Okay. Now there's two different types of speciation that has to do with the amount of time it takes to go through the process. Uh, one is called gradualism. That would be the one on the left here. Uh, the idea is that you have your original your population, and over time, or a long time, small changes, small incremental changes occur that create the two different species. Punctuated equilibrium states that, you know, you have your one species, there's some type of mutation, some barrier that forms, there's something that happens catastrophically that forces the populations to change uh, or separate, and that's what happens here. So instead of incremental changes, there's big changes, okay? Now, there's arguments for both. You can't really say one or the other. Uh, because of the lack of fossils in the fossil record, you can't really necessarily say for sure which one is actually occurring. All right, real quick, lastly, cladistics and phylogeny. Okay, the idea that you can show relatedness of species based on shared characteristics, or if, as they call them, derived characteristics. Okay, they use something called a cladogram, which is what this picture is here. Okay, if you look at the cladogram, I have my different groups of uh, organisms here. I have sharks, fins, uh, ray finned fish, which would be bony fish, amphibians, primates, rodents, and rabbits, crocodiles or reptiles, and birds. Okay, now if you look, okay, each time there is a split, that means that they had a common ancestor, but something occurred and they diverged from one another. Now each time there's a divergence, a new trait appears. So for example, all of my animals on my chart have a vertebrate. But only the animals starting from ray finned fish on have a bony skeleton. Sharks do not. They have a cartilaginous skeleton. Okay? Uh, ray finned fish do not have four limbs, but that appeared and this, that only occurs in these populations. They're tetrapods. Amniotic egg or amniotes, that would only be these four. Only mammals have hair, so that's a split here. And then only the reptiles and the birds, which are closer relatives than you might think, uh, have eggs with shells. Okay? So again, they're used to show similarity of traits and again if you share a line that means you shared traits and you have a shared ancestor okay so we did a little activity in class called what did a t-rex taste like and if you haven't done the activity i highly suggest you go to mrkabuski.com search for it and go do it it's from uh california berkeley it's a pretty cool little uh little online simulation or module that kind of goes through cladistics okay but the idea is that you find out that birds are the closest relative to dinosaurs. And you may not believe me, but you start to look at the similarities that they share, it actually makes a lot of sense. 
They have hollow bones. Think about when you bite in or you go get uh, chicken wings at your local establishment, and sometimes they're broken. You look inside, they're hollow in between. Well, that makes sense for birds because, you know, having hollow bones made them lighter and able to fly. It also makes sense for dinosaurs because it meant you were faster. Uh, S-shaped neck, uh, that occurred in both bone, in both dinosaurs and uh, birds. Uh, three toes in the front, one in the rear. Uh, one rear-facing toe. Think about Jurassic Park when that thing kind of touches down. Uh, birds have the exact same toes. Scales became modified feathers. Or, excuse me, modified scales became feathers. And they both lay uh, amniotic eggs you know, with a hard shell. Okay. And there's some examples, if you look at the fossil record, of the steps in between. This is known as the Archaeopteryx. Okay? And you can see here there's an impression of the feathers okay, of the Archaeopteryx. Now, you start to look at some of the characteristics of it. Archaeopteryx probably glided rather than actually flapping its wings and flying. But that would make sense because Archaeopteryx came from its relatives, which are the raptors. And raptors had those arms that they would kind of reach out to grab on to prey with. Well, it's the same motion that you use to fly or to stick out your arms to do a gliding motion. Okay? So we can kind of start to theorize that dinosaurs and birds must be pretty close relatives. So real quick to review, what is a species? Remember, they have to be able to reproduce and their offspring have to be able to reproduce. Two types of speciation, gradualism and punctuated equilibrium. And then cladograms are used to show derived characteristics, common ancestors, shared traits. Okay? Now there's some vocabulary I hope you learned. I know there's a lot of vocabulary for this section, so please, please, please go back and review this. I made a playlist on YouTube so you can go watch all the evolution videos, get all of your vocabulary done, and make sure you understand it. Because again, it's about being able to talk about this stuff. It's not necessarily just saying this is this. It's about being able to say, well, this happened because this happened, or this could happen because of this making predictions and hypotheses. Okay? That's the great thing about evolution is because it's a thinking. It's not just a matching and it's not just the A goes with B, okay? It could be A could go with C, and here's why, and being able to prove it, okay? So I hope you learned something. I hope you got a lot out of it. I know I get a lot out of talking about it. I know it's a lot of fun for me. If you have questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. Visit us at mrkowalski.wordpress.com. Contact me at, at Coach Kowalski on Twitter. Or if you want to know more about Cathedral, visit www.gocathedral.com. Go Irish!